Go for it. It's not red, it's green. Cool. Okay. Oh, wow, in there. Okay, can you hear me over there? You got to keep talking so I can get it up. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? How about now? Now? Good morning. Can you hear this? I'm okay. We're getting ready to start. We're doing the sound check right now. Okay, everybody. Benvindos a todos gents. Y feliz otuno. Uh, otherwise, welcome everybody and happy autumn. I don't know if uh, it smelled like this to you where you are, but to me, uh, it was very much a uh, feeling of fall smell in the air today. So um, I'm Roberta Silvera. I'm uh, one of Lama Jimpa's students, and I'm going to do a talk today on uh, what I did on my summer vacation and the seven point cause and effect meditation. But um, we're going to start with prayers first. So. Patty will be our, um, let me say. Praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, holy and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, Foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. 
I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jewel mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith, accepting these out of your boundless compassion, Please send forth waves of your blessings. Adam Guru Ratna Mandala Kamner Yatayami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no I element, and so on, and up to, and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. So we'll say it three times out loud and then by ourselves for 18. Tayata, 
Tekate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Ta eta gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Ta eta gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Taita gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you've indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivari Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Great. Uh, thank you. So as I said, my talk today is on uh, what I did on my summer vacation and the seven point cause of my meditation. And um, I wanted to talk about this today uh, because when I was in Portugal this summer, um, it came to my mind on several occasions for different reasons. And so I thought it might be um, good to have this conversation and uh, hopefully you all have some contributions to make in terms of your experience uh, regarding this as well. So I'm going to um, uh, talk about what happened in Portugal and then I'm going to briefly review the seven point cause and effect meditation uh, along with equanimity, which is really more what this talk is about. Um, and then hopefully, as I said, you'll have questions, comments, your own experience to talk about. And, um, you know, this is a hard thing, uh, our path. And so um, helping each other along the way is, uh, it just helps. Um, I want to thank Lama Jimpa for his ongoing support, confidence, and guidance uh, in general, and also in uh, putting this talk together today. Uh, always thank you to the Buddhist Bodhisattvas, past, present, and future, who continue to show us the way. Uh, and any and all errors today are my own. So um, my summer vacation was great. I went to Portugal for three weeks because um, next year I'm moving there. And so um, I've had a lot of time to do research and uh, to about how to get there, uh, the bureaucratic processes necessary. I've been to Portugal several times, but I'd never been to the town where I'm actually going to end up. So I wanted to have a trip where I could check out the grocery stores and the gyms and the nail salon and you name it, whatever everyday life encounters you have, that's what I needed to check out, as well as um, walkability because I'm not going to have a car. Um, so that took up two weeks of my vacation. And then the third week was to meet up with uh, three expat women who I've been communicating with via Zoom for several months now. Um, they're all from the US and one has been living in Portugal and the Algarve for three years already. One whom I met uh, in person and uh, before she left uh, in, she lived in Oakland prior, and then the other one moved from Oregon. So 
um, this was going to be our first uh, ability to meet each other in person. So um, I started in VCU, and um, I, many of you probably haven't been to Portugal, but like many other cities in Portugal, it's very beautiful um, with lots of ancient things there and all the quaintness that you can associate Europe with. It's definitely not as big as uh, Lisbon and Porto, the main cities people think of. Um, it's got about 60,000 people, but it has all the other things that those cities have great food. It's very affordable. Um, it's amazing how affordable it is compared to where we live. Um, and there's not much English spoken there, which is one of the reasons why I chose to move there so I can immerse myself in the language more readily. And it's full of history. Prince Henry, the navigator, I'm sure you've all heard of uh, during the age of discovery of Portugal and the world um, that is when they used to give away land to all of the noble people, that was his city, was you. Um, but I would say that the most striking feature for me during those two weeks that I was there was um, the people. And Portuguese people are known to be very kind, but the, and I know that from growing up in a Portuguese community because I'm of Portuguese heritage. And um, but I was amazed at the unconditional um, kindness because my Portuguese is not very good. And I was just, you know, checking out everyday things that the normal Portuguese people do. So it's not like they were catering to a tourist or something like that. But they went beyond any yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, you know, helping you kind of situation to actually making sure that whatever you were looking for needed that you got it and they would follow up to know that you had that and so that was really uh it touched my heart um to know that that degree of kindness is still out there because we certainly have a lot of challenges in our world here in the u.s and so it made me think of the seven point cause and effect meditation because it felt like they were my mothers they were taking care of me like they were my mothers and i was this person who was foreign and didn't know anything about their city. Um, and so that's kind of one part of the seven point cause and effect meditation in that part. But then the, I got, as those two weeks ended and I rented a car, I needed to know I could drive in Portugal and you'll all be glad to know it's very easy. They drive on the right side of the road. You better practice your stick shift. Uh, uh, memory because most cars there are that. Um, so I drove and um, the intent was to pick up this one woman from the Algarve in Coimbra where she had never been and we were going to spend a couple nights and then meet up with the other two in Leria where one had moved and one was meeting us from uh, Lisbon. So I did that. I drove to Coimbra and I picked up this woman who um, you know, on, on Zoom, we you get to have a relationship with people and you think it's like what it's going to be in real life, but really it turned out to be more like, you know, those uh, dating experiences online where you have these great conversations and then in real life it turns out to be who is this person, right? Um, so I met her and um, what I would say is, I, well, I had blindly sh uh, agreed to share five nights uh, she was sleeping with me in my same room and never even had a second thought that I shouldn't do that or I should ask what her habits are or anything. But come to find out, uh, you know, she came down the, the rampart there from the train station and she had cane in hand. She had like piles of luggage, like she was going to be there for a month. And um, I'm like, whoa, wait, you know, what's going on here? And um, so quickly I found out that she has multiple illnesses, she has poor mobility, she has poor sleep habits, um, like is up half the night, almost all the night, lights are turned on, busy doing whatever she's doing on the computer, and she has sleep apnea. So if her machine undoes itself, then there's a lot of snoring. So I went from one instance of, oh, there's all these wonderful, mother-like people in Vizu to having other thoughts about the seven point cause and effect meditation in a different way. And I'm like, okay, how does this person who you know as friend go from that to 
essentially faux or, you know, aversion, no attraction there, and eventually back to, you know, some more equanimity. But it was really striking to me that on the same trip, two different cities, and in reality, this happens to us, and the teachings tell us that it happens all the time in our day, you know. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I have to say about that. But when I thought about it and contemplated it and meditated on it, that was really my main focus of practice while I was there. You know, how was I going to survive these five nights with this woman and have some sort of equanimity and that? And um, so that's what I realized. That was the, the true lesson in all of this experience was the lack of equanimity that I had. And so I thought it would be... Um, uh, good to talk about that because I don't know about you, but this is a challenge for me, just not on vacation, but um, in everyday life. So um, I'll just briefly talk a little bit through what is the seven point cause and effect meditation. So it's a teaching, a practice, a method by which we slowly, very slowly, learn to generate the altruistic intention, uh, which is bodhicitta or the awakening mind. And there's a couple of parts to bodhicitta. The first is the intention to benefit all sentient beings um, to the point that um, it, it would almost be painful for us to not see them, their suffering go away. Um, and then the second part of that is the intention to become a Buddha, because even though we have this wonderful intention to um, you know, help uh, benefit all sentient beings, we really um, have limited ability to do that. And so when we consider, well, how could that happen? We think of the Buddha, the qualities of the Buddha and realize that, well, we have to be a Buddha. And so we have that intent to become that ourselves. And there are seven parts to the uh, cause and effect meditation. The first is recognizing that all living beings have been our mother. And so that's, um, not hard if you have no problem with um, multiple lifetimes and eons of lifetimes uh, that are in Buddhism, but can be more difficult for people to consider if that isn't in your bailiwick yet. Um, and then we re recall their kindness. So they birthed us, they fed us, they educated us so that we are what we are now and have the ability to learn the Dharma. And third, we then wish that we, from all of this kindness, we, we wish and we need to repay that kindness. Um, and so that becomes our intention. Um, and that moves on to part four, which is heartwarming love. So um, eventually we, in our actions, our practice, um, that's our intention that um, all, ha all sentient beings have happiness. So when we can look at people and this, uh, with equanimity like this in our um, love, essentially, um, we develop compassion uh, such that our intention is to free um, people of their suffering and the causes of suffering. And uh, that then moves to great resolve where we say, well, not only is that a cool thing to happen, but I'm going to be the one to make that happen. And those things together then help to create bodhicitta, which is the compassion and resolve portion and our wish to become a Buddha. So Buddhists like to talk about, um, you know, those list things and those books that are hard for some of us. And usually a lot of them are based on, they talk about the basis, method, and result. So in this meditation, the first uh, three, uh, recognizing your mother, uh, recollecting the kindness, and wishing to repay that would be, um, I believe, the basis uh, for um, generating and benefit, benefiting others. And four, five, and six, heartwarming love, compassion, and great resolve, those are the methods by which we do that. And the end result is bodhicitta. So all of these teachings, this lovely meditation, no matter what book you open, um, and I did forget to mention, I used a ton of books uh, making this um, 
talk. So I use Becoming Enlightened by His Holy, Holiness the Dalai Lama, the Middle Length Treatise on the Stages of the Path to Enlightenment. That's a new publication and very good. Um, Transforming the Heart by Geshe Jampa Chaykok. And I love this book. And if you haven't read it, would recommend you do so. The Great Treatise on the Stages of the Path to Enlightenment, The Lama and Chen Mo by Tsongkhapa. The Words of My Perfect Teacher by Patro Rinpoche and Cultivating True Compassion uh, by Kenshin Tenga Rinpoche. And all of these books, um, in talking about this, no matter what, and I would say in all of the, um, the Buddhist teachings, they're all about um, compassion, they're all about bodhicitta. But in order to have that, you, we have to have equanimity for all sentient beings. And so that's the real challenge. That's what was definitely missing for me and or what I realized um, during my vacation. And so I don't know, but I imagine it can be a challenge um, for everyone else too. And what is equanimity? Well, um, it's again, the foundational basis for doing the seven point cause and effect meditation. But it's the mind that's free from attachment to those who are dear, aversion to those who are difficult, and apathy to strangers. And the Dalai Lama in his book says, it's not a matter of saying, um, I have friends and enemies, or I'm not going to have friends and enemies. Uh, really, the, the thing is to stop reacting to someone uh, as a friend and uh, as an enemy. It's stopping that reaction is what is important. Um, there's a couple of different quotes that I'll read from the, the books. Um, Dalai Lama in his book said, if you don't eliminate the bias of being attached to some and being hostile to others, any love or compassion you generate will be biased. And so, you know, that's a really good thing to reflect on because a lot of our practice is our intention. And um, if we have, and it's also mixed with the practice. So sometimes if we have an intention, but it's really not um, accurate, then it affects the end results of, of what happens. So Nkapa said, it's not the notion of friend or enemy that you need to stop, but the bias that comes from attachment and hostility, which are based on the reason that some people are your friends and others your enemy. And Shantideva said, we, stop, we seek to stop using the fact that someone is harming you or your friends as a reason to be hostile to that person. And he further says, instead, you should take this same fact and use it as a reason for practicing patience towards that person. It's the supreme op opportunity when you have an enemy for generating the important practice of compassionate forbearance. And I know we've all heard that one uh, quite a lot, actually. So um, how do we do this uh, meditation on equanimity? Um, I'll just give you the briefly the steps. Um, you know, it's something I think we should be doing on a regular basis um, because it's a challenge to us every day in our practice. And um, so we start, it's easier to start with someone that you like uh, instead of someone you don't like. And um, so we start with a friend and then we move to a foe and then we move to a stranger or someone we don't feel either way about. You start with one person and then you move out to a larger, say, your neighborhood and then your city, and then eventually you get to all sentient beings with that same category. So it's, it's not too hard to do it with a friend. I can tell you I had, uh, I, I tried to do it with Donald Trump a lot and I had to keep going back and keep trying to do it. So there's always somebody who's, you know, a sticking point, but we should continue to try and go back and back and back. So what we need to look at is that the relationship hasn't always been like this. Um, you know, in other lives, they were our friends in, or our enemies or strangers. 
And in our current lives, whoever these are, the same thing. And the example is in my own experience on summer vacation, um, my friend was also um, an aversion for me. And so it, it can change, you know, in the span of a, the same day. Um, so we look at um, this person or this experience of uh, positive or negative, and we realize that it's an emotional reaction to friend, foe, or stranger, and nothing else. It's not real otherwise. And we look at the clinging emotion um, that we have related to this. And so that's what we meditate on and contemplate and gradually, 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 um, hopefully start to change our mind on that point. And the more we do it, the easier, hopefully it becomes. Um, so when Lama was helping me um, to think about what to say in this uh, talk, he, he said a lot of things in Darshan. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just um, quote some of the things he said because they're so much smarter than the things that I have to say to you. So um, he said, we must continually work on compassion and bodhicitta because bodhicitta in neon lights and capital letters equals life force. And he said that several times and has said that in several um, darshans to me. It's the bodhicitta is, is the prize. If we want to be free and we need to, tra we need to transform our relative self that avoids, and this was new for me to hear. So it was, I've been thinking about this one a lot a relative self that avoids or mundane bodhicitta to an ultimate self, a bodhisattva that doesn't avoid, but instead says, okay, yes, it's pretty crappy out there, but even with that, I'm still gonna benefit the world and I'm still gonna benefit all that, that crashing stuff happening out there. He said, bodhicitta is more than patience. And for me, a lot of times, you know, I think I'm doing a rippering job when I have patience. And um, so again, that's, that was uh, something else that w was good for me to reflect about. He says, we can't be totally happy and free until everyone is. So the only way to do that is to become a Buddha. And I, I think the biggest thing or the most striking thing he said to me because it's very difficult for me to see myself. Um, he said, it's not arrogant to have aspirations to a Buddha. It's not arrogant to have aspirations to be a Buddha. And um, so many times, uh, not only is it hard to follow this path, but you know, you feel deflated, like without the enough self-confidence to really think, oh yeah, man, I can do this, no problem. Um, so, and how do we develop bodhicitta? Well, we um, get help from the Dharma teachings, guidance from Lama, and then our own training and meditation of which the seven point cause and effect is um, part of that. And it's important for us to contemplate the qualities of a Buddha. And I don't know that I do that enough actually, and do it enough in relation to considering myself being able to have those qualities, I guess. Um, and we always need to make high aspirations. So Lana's always talking about that mountain and we're always looking up towards the top of the mountaintop, um, no matter where we are uh, on the mountain. Obstacles on the path are our friend, even though we don't like to think of them that way. There are op opportunities to practice the, the path. And finally, he said the Buddhist path um, requires not only renunciation, but also the two wings of compassion and emptiness or um, wisdom. So really, this is uh, pretty short and sweet. And so, um, you know, I have a couple of questions that I thought of, and um, I'll just put those out there. Um, and then, you know, I'd love to hear what your questions, comments, um, experiences are, because really that's um, hopefully how we help each other to further ourselves along this path. So 
um, first off, you know, what has your experience been? What challenges and successes have you had when um, thinking about equanimity or trying to practice it or having mishaps along the way? And one thing for me that um, has been difficult is, uh, you know, it's hard enough to be, um, have equanimity toward all sentient beings. And if that's hard, then how do I stay motivated to keep moving towards bodhicitta? And particularly, I mean, in these times of COVID, of course, you know, we're, I don't know about you, but I'm really burnt out. I'm a healthcare provider. And I, some days I feel like there's none of that left. You can just forget it. I'm going to go dig a hole. So um, it, it's a challenge um, for sure. And then one question um, Lama said at my last darshan, which was, um, I liked it. And so I think about it. I don't have any answer, of course, but he said, well, what does it feel like to be really alive? And he wasn't talking about, you know, breathing or um, your heart beating or anything like that. So, so that's it. And um, thank you. And now I'd like to put it out there for anybody who has uh, anything to say. Hi, good morning. My name is Melanie. Thank you so much. Does that hit home? Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, Roberta, because that really hits home. And um, I just thought I'd share one of my experiences and kind of maybe what I learned from it. Um, it was a few years ago, so I hadn't been into the Dharma as heavily as I might be now, but I had been, you know, trying to practice things. But I too, I wanted to take a vacation to um, Nicaragua with the Oceanic Society. I've done a lot of trips with them. And uh, there, I'm, I'm a single when I go, and so it's very important financially that I have somebody that can share. Well, this one particular trip, they, it was, it's a long story, which I won't share, but it turned out they would take two participants if we were willing to share a room and I needed to share. So I said, sure, I'll share. I've been other places and I've shared with lots of people and I'm pretty friendly, you know? So I didn't think about it. I said, sure. And I was thinking I'm, you know, of a more advanced age and this will probably be a young person that can kind of help me things. So anyway, and no internet, so I couldn't do what you did. So blindly, truly blindly, I, I went and we finally got a phone call together at the very end. And uh, she said, oh, I said something about, well, I'm, you know, certain age and I, I hope this is okay. I hope I can do it. It was a, it's a snorkeling trip to some pretty heavy duty snorkeling areas in the world. And uh, she said, oh, that's okay, I'm 84. <laughs> and I went, okay, that was the first little flag. And I said, okay, when well, we sounded nice. Well, we got there and we had to share rooms for 10 days all through this foreign country, all this advanced snorkeling. And, the, and to me, she had a very abrasive personality, a very dominating, very domineering person, very um, negative about things. And, and I'm going, oh my goodness, how am I going to make it through like you? And we had some quite big conflicts. And it was very, very difficult. <laughs> but I tried practicing first patience. And, and I was successful. And I, the other, then I started practicing giving her the best thing. We, you know, we'd be in a room and I'd, have, I'd sleep in the little crummy little cot. And she could have the big king size bed. You know, I, I was doing all these things. And, and then I began to realize how, how difficult life must be for her and why she had this type of reaction to everything. And she would say, well, I don't know. I've never been on a trip where I found people that were you know, nice to me or whatever. And I thought, how painful. And I really developed some real compassion for this woman realizing that the reason she'd never found anyone that was nice was because of her person, you know, her kind of attacking personality, negative. And what I just realized today when you were speaking was that all the irritating things that she did to me, I, oh, I could recite them verbally for word, word for word for years. <laughs> and I realized that now all of those things have disappeared. And what's left is 
my, my concern for her, my appreciation for how she was helping me to learn patience and to learn compassion for people that are, are behaving in a very difficult way because they're suffering a lot. It's funny you say that because um, a lot of your path has to be in functional integration. You know, okay, let her do the jitter that she wants, let her do this. And so that was a lot of my methodology. And you're right, after a while, I'm like, it's a little weird. But it took a while to get there because. <laughs> we had some big blow ups <laughs> a couple of times, but we do get there. So it works. Sharing. It works, I guess. Oh, thank you. That was just my sharing story. Okay, I'm waiting to see if there's anybody in Zoom land. Okay, hey there. Can you hear me? Okay, Andrew, you go first. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry if I cut anyone off. Um, hey, Roberta, I, I had to thank you for your talk. I had to join a little bit late, so I don't know if you've kind of covered some stuff I'm going to ask about, but can you hear me okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I was just saying I was, uh, I had to join you a little bit late, so I apologize if I'm asking a question you already covered, but um, I was kind of sharing the uh, connection to you as a healthcare worker. And I think that that's where I've been having my hardest time with equanimity in COVID. Yeah, I, my practice object was Trump and now it's people who um, have ridiculous reasons for not getting vaccinated and, um, and, and taking up healthcare uh, from people who have made a more uh, responsible choice, shall we say, uh, to benefit others. Um, and so I don't know if, you, if that's something you've been having to deal with or if you have thoughts about how to bring the seven point mind training to that specifically. I mean, I don't know. That's just where I, I still find myself stuck. Yeah, I'm still very definitely having difficulty with that. And in addition, I'm retiring in March after 44 years in the healthcare field. And so I got short timers really bad and my level of patience ability to deal with this is really a challenge and to be honest it's one of the things I talked to Lama and Darshan about a lot because um, it's just really hard and my my work um, you know everybody talks about COVID and everybody's dying and I have a hard job I talk to people about dying every day I work in neuro-oncology and so um, it's, I don't have a really good method. Part of, um, part of my method, which has sustained me in terms, in, in, other than just doing regular meditations, uh, is, um, and the ability to do that now during COVID is much less, I would make sure that I would take care of my health in terms of, um, being out in nature, going for walks, just sort of clearing my head. I belong to a, a string adult string orchestra and going and playing a music every week. Well, I didn't realize till that all those things went away, how much they contributed to my ability to um, have more compassion for um, people in general. And um, so now that a couple of those have returned, um, now I, I realize it better, but it's it's a still a huge struggle for me. And again, your, your point to people using um, reasoning that to me makes no sense whatsoever uh, from a scientific point of view um, and taking up resources that are scarce to begin with are um, really hard for me, and it's uh, hard for me not to say things to them, actually. I wish I had a good answer. Well, maybe compassion sometimes is, uh, is, isn't always being agreeable, if that's the right way to put it. Um, it I well, care about you, and I care about your health and the health of others, uh, and that's why I think you should get vaccinated. Um, that's that's a place of compassion in a sense, like not giving up on people, in a sense. 
Maybe. If if that's the case, if that's the right answer, then you can bet I've had that conversation with a lot of my patients. And um, I know Invermectin is the new Clorox. Um, and so I've had a lot of those conversations as well. And um, sometimes it's hard to do that because mostly it's hard to do that. People don't want to hear it. And it can also affect the other message you have related to um, their disease process. And in my case, it's a bad disease process in general. So I usually save the COVID, are you vaccinated question to the end of the visit actually. Well, um, I guess it, it's uh, weirdly reassuring that we struggle with this together. Um, I don't think there is the easy solution, but um, definitely trying to um, avoid um, anger and, and uh, you know, I think yes. frustration is natural, but have, helping it not morph into anger. That's, that's the real goal. Yeah, actually, that's true because um, in healthcare, you know, there are biases. And um, if you're having that sort of aversion uh, feeling, it can. Um, it and does uh, for any and all people involved in healthcare affect your response uh, to uh, patients that you take care of. So that's definitely something that I'm always trying to be aware of for sure. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Roberta, we have an online question from Melanie and she needs to leave in a moment. So if you could do that one first. Sorry, Susan. Do I push a button to know what that is? Nope. She just needs to unmute herself. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Roberta. Blessings and thank you for your talk. Um, I appreciate your time. It was it, I tuned in at the right time because um, my issue is exactly with equ equanimity this, um, at this time in my life, and it's so much. It's so wow. I have so much to say, but I'm just trying to pinpoint it. So. <laughs> my uh it's with my mom my mom is residing with me at this time and we have such differences I mean extreme differences she's very controlling I love her to death I had the greatest upbringing the best childhood you know nothing but positive memories throughout my entire childhood and upbringing with my mom um I just have, she's just a type of personality that I am not relating to. I'm going to be 50 years old and her back in my home and her being controlling and taking over everything. And there's such resentments I have with her that I'm working so hard to be rid of these resentments and to be at peace with her because I know she's just troubled and I, I would not want nothing but the best for her. But I'm, I'm having such issues with how to deal with that when nothing I ever do works out. My resentments remain. This tension is always there. It's unhealthy throughout the entire time. I I don't know if it's a question. I guess it was just venting and speaking and relating to everything that you said was so helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Just ask how do I go about when it's the bond between the mother and the daughter and without telling her, please leave my house now. <laughs> you know like I don't know I don't know where to go with it or what to do it just but I I appreciate your input yeah well I know I definitely don't have uh, the absolute answer to that but um, you know I think some trying to understand you know what perspective she may be coming from to um, to have the view she has or the demands that she has. I certainly don't know your mom or you to, you know, have input into that, but that's, you know, you, you gather some information, but sometimes, you know, you have to have ground rules too. Um, I know recently I had an experience with my, I have three boys and um, we stay in, have weekly phone calls. And I would say over the past nine months or so, I just get this sense that things are not, you know, going, I'm not feeling the love and I'm not feeling that they're feeling the love. 
And so having conversations about the difficulty was really hard for me with them. And, um, but it was also really helpful because, you know, there were some ground uh, limits that were set, you know, like, mom, we're adults, you know, quit worrying about blah, blah, blah. You can't control everything. And so, I, you know, I don't know um, if having to take, not just look at your mom's point of view, but also, so where do you fit in the whole thing? And it's not anything that, you know, changes overnight for sure, but um, some considerations like that and uh, continuing to do the equanimity meditations, I think would be really helpful. And you know, maybe other people have other uh, suggestions uh, other than that, because I'm certainly no authority on any of it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, it's okay. been difficult. She's um, extremely controlling and like, I, I'm raising my five-year-old grandson and she's always undermining me in the middle there. And he's so confused. Like this was the path and this was the way. And now it's this, you know, it's, it's, no. it's, it's hard for me to deal with, you know. Those are those triangulated relationships. I do recall, you might wanna to go to Tupton Chojin's website. There is a teaching there about triangulated relationships that might be helpful for you. What website is it? Sravasti Abbey, um, Venerable Tupton Children. She has another website and I'm definitely not the IT maven to tell you how to access it, but um, you could certainly email them. And um, I think it's Venerable Samton who did a teaching on that. Um, they they talk about triangulated relationships in relation to how you can practice and make changes and things like that uh, in a dharma kind of way got it well thank you mm -hmm. thank you okay i'll jump in is this on yeah it's on um this is right along the line, I guess, of what everybody has been saying. Equanimity is a tough word for me. I don't really know what it, I can't feel what it means. What works for me is goodwill. I can feel goodwill. I can feel that in my body. I can feel that in my voice. I can feel that, you know, I mean, I can, that, that's, that's palpable for me. Equanimity is too much of a head word for me. But um, one of the things that I am finding helpful is not to think first about my intention or to, to no, keep my intention focused on goodwill, but to recognize or, yeah, I guess recognize that everybody's intention is also goodwill. So that when I run across um, a stranger, you know, just somebody, like yesterday, I was out running about 400,000 errands and you know, how you get kind of, well, I gotta go here and I gotta go there and rushy, rushy, pushy, pushy stuff, um, trying to get it all done. And it, plus it was Saturday, it was a stupid day to be doing it. But in any way, um, I, every, store that I went into, I made a vow, if you will, to have the expectation that everybody I was going to interact with had goodwill in their heart and goodwill in their mind, that they wished me well, they wished themselves well, I had the dog with me, they wished her well, and therefore that made me wish all of them well and the interactions were kind. And I don't know if that is equanimity or not, but it's what is working for me right now is to project, have the intention of goodwill and project that everybody on the other, you know, they also have goodwill. Mm -hmm. And then um, the atmosphere is is smooth. The atmosphere maybe might be equanimous. I'm not sure, but anyway, that's the one that works for me right now. 
Yeah, thank you. That that sounds great. It brings to me two thoughts. I um, have often and never knew what to call it. It wasn't goodwill, but a long time ago, I learned this saying, well, everybody's doing the best that they can in the space that they're in right now. And so that's kind of my line to use when I'm in those situations. But the thing that um, you said that caught my um, mind is that you said, before I go into the store, I made this intention. And so I think a lot of times we're so busy just not being mindful of our lives and rocking and rolling that we don't do a lot of activities mindfully. And so to be able to try and have that intention, in whatever we're doing, that's sometimes the hardest part. That's karma, right? I mean, you know, that's what karma is. Karma is intention. So everything rides on the tip of intention. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so you guys are off the hook. Thanks for coming, and we'll have uh, closing prayers then, and uh, see you next time. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasurer of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Lo Sang Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. Thank so, you. so maybe uh, if we have any announcements, Roberta, do you know? I don't know if we have any announcements. Do you, Connor? Uh, I don't have announcements, but I should look. Um, well, uh, um, excuse me, Connor, did you ask if I have announcements? Or? You have announcements about next week. Oh, I definitely, yes. So some of you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, some of you may already know this, but some of you may not. But um, next Sunday at 11, we're having a special friend come to give teachings to us. He's a really amazing teacher, and his name is Kenshin Rinpoche. And um, he's going to give teachings on the Amitayas um, sadhana. And so if you've had the empowerment that we had in June, June 27th, then this would be a really uh, wonderful opportunity to learn more deeply what that practice means. And then also, uh, we're going to be doing mantra rolling um, because we have a very special statue that was um, brought to us a little more than a year ago, and we weren't able to um, put mantras within it because of COVID. But now we're, a few of us are coming together to roll mantras. And um, there's like, I think there's 28 different ones. It's a very, very special activity. So uh, that's gonna be, uh, maybe, is it, um, I need to ask you, Connor, cause I'm not sure. 1.30. 1.30 today, but also on Saturdays, I believe. Okay. And then um, let me think. Of, I can think of anything else. I I maybe ask my friends because that's I can't think of other announcements. Do you do you know any others, Connor or Susan or Roberta, that you'd like to, to share? Check the calendar, read the roar. That's okay. So I I think you can hear Connor, but he's saying check the calendar, read the roar, and uh, and then shoot us an email if we've missed something. 
So thank you so much. Thank you, Roberta, for your talk. And thank you for all the people that shared and asked questions and shared your lives with all of us, because I actually always learn from those questions. That's for sure. Okay. Thank you. Have a great week, everybody.